This summer, I'm looking at um, those first couple chapters of the book of Acts because the tagline for the Lutheran Congregations in Mission in Christ for our, our denomination is what it says at the top there, a first century church for the 21st century. That's not just a slogan they came up with. That is when the, the very first group of congregations that got together about 15 years ago now, and they said, how are we supposed to be the church today? Their starting point was to look at the very first congregations, the very first community of believers and say, how were they God's people? How were they a community of believers in the world at that time? And what can we learn from that? Not that, not that we should look just like them, but we have to be able to reach the larger culture the way they did. And so we look at the things that were priorities for them. We, looked at, we look at the things that say, uh, this is who we are, this is how we operate. And so um, in the book of Acts, which is written by Luke, same guy who wrote the Gospel of Luke, it's just the second half of that story, um, he talks about, in the second chapter, he talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit and Pentecost. And, and in that, then Peter gives a sermon. In that sermon, Peter says this. He says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will speak for God. It's the word it says there is it will prophesy. But that's what prophesy means, to speak for God. And, and Peter is laying out, a foundational idea for this community, this very first community of believers in Jesus Christ. And that is that everybody gets the Spirit of God. And everybody is connected to God. And, and everybody in, in different ways speaks for God. And, and Peter is laying this out as a foundational idea of who this community is and what this community looks like and how this community functions. That's the first thing he says. Um, that he tears down these barriers between, in their Jewish context, it would have been the priests and everyone else. And, and in our context, it would be the clergy and what we would call the laity, the people up front and the people in the pews. Peter is tearing those down and saying they don't exist in this community. So the question I left you with last week was, eh, how have we done with that over the last 2,000 years? Say, not so good. Because no sooner had Peter said this, than immediately the people in charge started trying to tell everybody else what they could and couldn't do and what they could and couldn't say. Where Peter says, no, that's not the way it is here. Um, so as soon as this sermon is over, um, then Luke puts in a little editorial comment. So this is, this is Luke looking back and saying this is what was going on there in those very first days of this Christian community. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. And it says, so all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to fellowship, and to sharing meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. So they spent time learning who Jesus was and what he did. And they learned it from people who had been with Jesus for three years, that lived with Jesus. And they would share with them, this is what Jesus was like. And, and the big thing they would have that we don't have is, you know, they could ask Peter or one of the other apostles and say, you know what, uh, what was, tell me a joke Jesus said sometime because they never wrote him down. Or, you know, what, 
Something on a more personal level, that's a huge advantage for them because for us, Jesus can become almost unreal in the sense of not being a real person. So they spent their time learning about Jesus, learning who he was, learning what he did. They spent their free time together and they shared meals together. Now, if you read a commentary on the Bible or when I was in seminary or professors, they would talk about this. They talk about how important meals were in the first century, that meals were a big deal. And I think and, and for a long time, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I didn't think about that much. But I thought, no, that's, there's still a big, if you invite someone to your house for supper, that's kind of a big deal. It means either they're a friend of yours or you want them to be a friend of yours. So I, I don't think we need to get outside of our own cultural experiences to understand what a big deal it is that, that Luke points out, they shared their meals together. They spent time together. This is going to become more apparent uh, as we go through these next few verses why this is really such a big deal. And there's one really big lesson we're going to get um, on, on that spending time together here. It says, A deep sense of awe came over all of them, or over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. Now, I know in my mind, I immediately want to go to miraculous signs and wonders. But that's not Luke's primary thing here. Luke's primary thing here is their sense of awe. They understood God was doing something new, and they were part of it. Now, one of the constant challenges of the modern church is to keep worship, as they say, fresh and relevant and meaningful. These are all words that people use when they're talking about worship. And there are some people, if you do the same service four times, they're like, oh, can't we do something different? They had been basically doing the same worship service for a thousand years. And now this new community comes and is doing something completely different in a different way. But it wasn't that it was, it wasn't how it was different that got them. It's that it was different because God was up to something. And they understood they were involved in something God that was doing that had never been done before, creating this new community around Christ. And, and so the miraculous signs and wonders are just, Luke is adding that to say what kind of awe was going on there. It's like they're in awe of what God is doing, and part of what God was doing led to these signs and wonders. Their awe isn't because of the signs and wonders. Their signs and wonders are part of the awe. The big thing is God's up to something, and they get to be part of it. Um, I've, I've, I've read some books you know, by people who were involved in like monumental moments in history. And one of the things many of them say is, it was just fascinating to be involved in something that changed the course of history, just to have a small part in it, just to be there when it happened. These disciples are there. These first believers are there. They are part of something new. They're part of something different. And they're in awe that they get to be part of it. All the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. Right off the bat, I have to point out, they are not communists. They did not form a commune. People still have individual property and individual ownership of things. But when there was someone in need in the community, they valued that person more than they valued their property or the things they had, and so they would sell them to help that person in need. As a pastor, I can, there's one thing I think about that really as in a pastor's life relates to this, and if you've known pastors, you know this is true. Pastors and books is a crazy relationship. 
When I came here, I left over 300 books at my previous office because I simply didn't have room for them here. My previous office was a house, so I had like 2,000 square feet of book space and I had rooms filled with books. And, and the reality is, well, when, when Julie and I were in seminary, periodically you would see a box of books sitting outside the bookstore labeled for free. You know what that meant? A pastor had died. Because that's the only time they give away their books for free. They value those books more than anything. And, and if they're like me, they've never even read a lot of those books that they have on their shelves. And... But I, I met a pastor once, I was talking to him, and he said, you know what, I never, I never buy a book intending to keep it. Every buy I book, I intend, every book I buy, I intend to give away. I thought, wow, that's interesting. He values the people he's going to give those books to more than he values the book. I thought, that's not normal for a pastor. They usually value those books over just about anything. That's the way in that early community. They valued the other people in the community more than anything else. And so they were willing to sell property. They were willing to sell their goods. And just to put this on a whole nother level, in ancient Israel, it was supposed to be against the law to sell property. That's a, that's a rule that was put down in the Old Testament. Right in the early days, you can't sell your property because it was a gift from God, that promised land. They didn't really follow it. But still the ideal was there, that this land is a gift from God. But in that early community, they would say, yeah, this land was a gift from God, and now I'm making it a gift to this other person. I'm not going to hoard this gift that God has given me. I'm going to give it to somebody else. And so they put the other people in the community above anything else. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. They didn't start a church. In fact, they continued to worship at the temple until the temple told them, you are not welcome here. They worshiped at the temple until the temple was destroyed by the Roman armies. But here's the thing. They got together outside of worship more than they worshiped together. Fellowship took precedence over worship. And I wonder, when did that change in the church? I, I, really, I could, historically, I could do some digging and I could pinpoint, but I just want us to ponder it. Ponder how it is that worship took precedence over fellowship instead of fellowship over worship. In, in the very first community of Christians, worship was part of their fellowship together. It wasn't a tag-along to worship. And I think, just like I asked last week, I said, how has the church done over the last 2,000 years with this idea that all, everybody, men and women alike, can speak for God? How has the church done with that? I asked the same question. How has the church over the last 2,000 years, how has it handled this idea that spending time together is of paramount importance, even more than worship? When I think of churches that have tried to put fellowship ahead of worship, at least in my mind, I go to some really bad places. Because I start thinking Jonestown, Branch Davidian, you know, whatever, whatever crazy group is coming out of Waco this decade. Because those groups, they put fellowship as everything, but they do it to the exclusion of anyone else. But in that early church, in those, that first community of believers, that spending time together was number one for them. And it says that 
Uh, and, and so they had this care and generosity for each other, and other people noticed. And because other people noticed, each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. The evangelism strategy of that first community of believers was very simple. We're going to create a community that loves to be get it together so much and cares for each other so much, people on the outside will want to be part of it. And they went from, from dozens to thousands in a matter of a few weeks. Never in the history of the church have we seen growth like that first community had, those, that, just those first couple of years. All the money that we've poured into missions and evangelism and all of those, we have never matched their one simple strategy of creating a community people want to be part of. That's all they did. They left the rest up to God. And they just were a community that was generous with one another and, and placed the, the needs of each other above anything else. But here's the thing, to really understand what, why Luke puts this little comment right in here in this place. It says um, that daily God was adding to those who were being saved, but the word saved, if I were to say, I hadn't had that up there yet, and I just said, you know, something about getting saved. Most people in church are going to think of one of two things. You're either going to think of getting to go to heaven or not going to hell. Because that's how most Christians talk about getting saved or being saved. But that's about that much of the meaning of the word. Really, all it means is to deliver from a direct threat or to bring safe and sound out of a difficult situation. Towards the end of the book of Acts, Paul, who's on a missionary journey, is in a shipwreck. And when he's saved from the ocean in this shipwreck, Luke writes that Paul was sozo. He was delivered from a life-threatening situation. So when we see that word saved there, what Luke is really saying is he's saying, those being added were being, brought, were being brought safe and sound from a difficult situation, that is life, into this new kind of community where people cared for each other. What we might call being saved, that's either avoiding hell or getting to go to heaven, is a part of that. But it is by no means all of it. Because here's Luke's point, and the point that is a really tough question for us to answer. Um, and that is this early community of believers saw themselves as, uh, I, I guess I'll put it this way, heaven on earth. They saw themselves as this community of God's people who are living in God's grace now for this life and one day will live in his presence eternally. So here's what I wrote. It says, this community of believers was supposed to be representative of what the eternal community would look like. I had a friend I was in the guards with and, and during our lunches sometimes we'd play cards and he'd he had a favorite thing all the time. He'd play a card and he'd say, this is an indicator. You know, it's like, okay, now I know what I'm supposed to play because he played his, if you're a card player, you know how that works with partners. You get your indicator cards. This early community was to be an indicator of what life in God's presence would look like. So we need to ask ourselves, do we look like God's eternal community? Not are we good people. The answer to that will always be a resounding no. Not are we perfect. We're not. But does this community give people an indication of what heaven is like? Now, if you're really an Iowan, 
you've seen the movie and maybe been to visit the Field of Dreams. And when he walks out of the corn, what's he say? Is, is this heaven? It's Iowa. Iowa? Something that he saw, something that he experienced, caused him to believe that where he was might just be heaven, the perfect place. Think of your own experiences, because we come from many different backgrounds, many different kinds of churches, from from rural churches, suburban churches, town churches, city churches, big churches, small churches, different denominations. Think of your own experiences. Have you been in a church that ever caused you to say, all right, I understand a little bit better what heaven is like, not by their teachings, but by the community itself. Now, If you've ever been in a church and you thought, this is not what God intended, this is not, they're not acting like God's people, I don't want to hear about that because I've had plenty of my own experiences like that. But I honestly would like to hear from you if you've ever been a part of a church and in that church, because of the way that church was, just the way the people were with each other, that the that you would think to yourself, you know what? Yeah, that church is an indicator, though that community is an indicator of what it will be like to live eternally in God's presence. I would love to hear about that because that church is doing something right because that's what we're supposed to be. People are supposed to see us, just like Ray Liotta in Field of Dreams where he says, is this heaven? People are supposed to look at communities of God's people and say, I see a little bit more what heaven will be like. I see a little bit more. I understand a little bit more of what God is up to and where God is taking us. That's a hard question we need to ask ourselves all the time. We we tend to ask ourselves, oh, you know, are we welcoming to visitors? Are we inviting? Are we open? But really what we need to ask is this. When people look at this community, are they seeing an indicator of what life in God's presence really looks like? Because if they are, we need to build on that. And if they're not, we need to ask ourselves some really tough questions. Let us pray. Lord God, as we are looking at these, the first days and weeks and months of of your community on earth. We pray that we can learn from it. We pray that, that just like those, those first Christians, we can be a, a community that is generous and caring towards each other and that people will see that in us and that they would want to be part of that. We don't pray that, Lord, just for our own little community here, but for all your people in, in all places. We pray, Lord, that, that you would open our, open our hearts, open our minds to, to understanding truly what it means to be your people here. So that when people look at us, they would say, yes, I see God there. I see what a community shaped by God's presence, looks like. We pray you would lead us in this endeavor. In Jesus' name, amen.